Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So as you can see from the caption, this is going to be another one of my solo playthrough uh, series. I'm kind of inserting this in between a lot of the miniature games I was doing because I was a little burnt out with that. I wanted to do something a little more structured, a little more interesting, a little more operational. And so I am going to be playing Axis and Allies. This is the Axis and Allies Operations Manual. I believe this is the, let's see if we can get the copy right here. Uh, this is actually one of the newer versions of Axis and Allies, if I can, if I can give it to you here, because uh, I can't find the copyright, but uh, I will show you the box. Okay, so this is the box for the version that I am going to be playing solo. Uh, it is kind of a revised version of Axis and Allies, although it is not a truncated version. So like Axis and Allies Europe is somewhat truncated. It focuses mostly on Europe. Uh, there's like Axis and Allies, uh, one of the naval versions or Pacific. This is actually the entire Axis and Allies and it is uh but it is revised and i'm going to go over kind of what is different in this uh for those of you who may not be familiar with it okay so first of all axis and allies is a tabletop uh war game usually for three to uh four players i think is the max in this version and you are re basically replaying world war ii on a global scale representing the Axis powers, which in this game are Germany and Japan, and the Allied powers, which are the United States, Great Britain, and Russia, <coughs> or the Soviet Union, as it was called back then. So the game, this one begins in the spring of 1942. They do have a version that begins, <coughs> excuse me, in 41, which I might have, but I don't think I, this, I don't think I, I played it uh, solo. Now I used to play Axis and Allies solo as a young, young man by myself growing up. I remember so many nights I would set this up and literally play hours and hours into the night, just playing out these battles. And believe it or not, it is a very fun game to play solo. It is not easy, but it is fun. And the way I'm going to do this game is I am going to kind of set national objectives for each of the nations and that will kind of guide me in what they will do or what they won't do. So basically, uh, once I establish their objectives for the war, I'm going to try to limit them to that. So we won't have a lot of weird things jumping off. Uh, that can say, well, if they hadn't have done that, they, they wouldn't have lost. So I'm going to try to go over those, but that will be in a separate video. In this video, I am just going to explain the game, explain kind of what is going to be going on, and I'm going to take a look at the initial setup of Japan. And then from there, uh, I will do a separate video on the next nation. Now, first of all, in Axis and the Allies, the game is basically about taking and controlling territory. This is all done through moving units and then conducting battles. If you win a battle, you will obviously take the territory. Now, as you will see on the map, certain territory is color-coded to show who it begins to at the start of the game. So this grayish-blue is Germany. This military green is the United States. This uh, greenish tan is Canada. The gray, the, the banded grays are uh, typically neutral. And there is some benefits to moving into, I mean, uh, some, uh, there is some penalties for moving into neutral territories. This reddish brown is Russia. This uh, tan brown or orange brown is Japan. And I think that is all of them. Well, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, is kind of this khaki color. So I think most of this is actually Great Britain. I might have said Canada. But Canada in this game is kind of represented as part of Great Britain or the United Kingdom. So having explained all of that, and I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this game, the game proceeds in turns. And it's very interesting because the turn order in this game is fixed. It never changes. 
and uh, it has a big impact on how things play out. Now, I've never tried to play it with random turn order. Maybe I will do that uh, in the future, but for this time, I'm going to stick to the turn order because there is a very uh, practical reason why it's played out that way. Uh, typically, I think Germany goes, then I think Russia goes, and then I think Japan and the U.S. I, I do kind of remember the U.S. being last. I will... I will take a look at that real quick. So, uh, because that is kind of significant in how how the game plays out is the orders in which the, the, the forces move, believe it or not. So the order of play is this, I'm sorry, the Soviet Union, Germany, the UK, Japan, the United States, and then you check for victory. Now, in... The original Axis and Allies, you got victory once you captured the capital of both of your Axis powers or your your, in, your opposing powers. So for Germany and Japan, they would get victory if they captured Russia, the United States, and the United Kingdom, which is not easy, but it could be done very quick if you're good. Uh, the Allies would get victory if they captured Germany and the capital of Japan. <laughs> In this version, however, there are things called victory cities. Because typically trying to get a total victory by putting basically nations out of the game is just very long. I mean, it just goes on and on unless somebody concedes. I mean, you could literally, because even if your capital is taken, if you're allies are not out of the game you can stay in as long as you have units you just can't bring new ones in but if they take it back for you you're back in the game again so the game could just go on and on and recycle and i mean that is the wonderful part of it but it's also why it's it's very rarely on the table other than at con conventions so in this version though there are victory cities and each victory city has a number of points associated with it um uh, or at least, I guess, the number that you control. So in this side, if the Axis, for example, had eight victory cities, they'd have a minor victory. If they had 10, they'd have a major. And if they had 12, they'd have a total. And so, obviously, you start with your own victory cities. So the Allies start with two, four, six victory cities. The Axis start with three, six victory cities. So basically, you would need to get at least two more of the others by the end of the game to have a minor victory or you need four more to have a major so basically you could pretty much play as one as long as you wanted till there was either a major victory a total victory or a minor victory and that would go by at the end of that turn you know how many were controlled and i do like that i've played this version before and I like it because it does put some emphasis on recapturing key areas that were key during the war and not simply doing a bunch of all or nothings. Even though that is that is great to see when you have troops just surrounding Russia as Germany tries to move in uh, to put Russia out of the war. But because of the victory cities, that is not as easy to pull off. And it balances out though because now the U.S. has to watch their western border here which is the los angeles so in a lot of games in axis and allies you might see the u.s leave one or two pieces here and you know if it gets taken they just take it back later but now because this is a victory city the u.s has to defend that which is what they were always worried about in world war ii and of course why hawaii was so important to intercepting any move by japanese on the western shore of the united states uh once I decide what everybody's objectives is, I'm either going to play to a major victory or a total victory, whichever one occurs first. Uh, and I will let you guys know. I mean, obviously, if they're at 8 and 8, uh, since I think there is 24, so they could actually be at 8 and 8, which would be 16. Is that correct? I don't know. But either way, I will either play... So that till one side gets a total victory or one side gets a major victory, and I will let you know. But having discussed that, what I want to look at now is kind of the setup 
for the First Nation, I'm going to discuss kind of what's interesting about the setup and uh, give you some more details on that. And then uh, in the next video, we will look at the next nation to get set up. So the first nation that I have set up here is Japan. And this is obviously, this is after December of 1941, uh, when Japan made that massive push into the Pacific and all of the Pacific islands uh, after December 7th on through the 10th and 12th and so forth of December. So... This is really a very uh, enlarged presence for Japan than in the original game, where I think they're like on Japan, Manchuria, and then Okinawa. So in this game, they, there is a very large presence, uh, and they are on these islands. Now, the numbers you see by here is, are called economic points. There is an economic point factor that each nation keeps, which allows them to replace vehicles and tanks, but also allows them to research new developments in the war like jets rockets submarines uh and eventually obviously would be a nuclear bomb which i may put a, a solo option in here for a nuke and what i was thinking of doing is if one nation gets all of the advancements the next one they could get would be a nuclear bomb and then what a nuclear bomb would be is if you place it in any area uh it basically destroys everything there uh, but we will see. I mean, that's just kind of a fun little knickknack. But so let's look at the setup of Japan. They have infantry and a sub in the Solomon Islands, infantry in New Guinea, an aircraft carrier with fighters here in the East Indies, as well as a battleship. Uh, they are here off of French Indochina. They are in the Caroline Islands, this is a destroyer, a carrier, the Philippine Islands, Okinawa, Wake Island, and then of course Japan. So as you can see in Japan, they have a battleship, a destroyer, a bomber. They have a transport here off of uh, Shanghai or Kwatong. Uh, and then they, the one thing, so in looking at the Japanese force, the one thing you will notice is they are very, uh, they are very well supplied with naval and air power to start 1942. Uh, they have two aircraft carriers, two battleships, two destroyers, probably a total of a half dozen planes. What they do not really have is almost any armor. They have an armored vehicle here. This is one artillery piece. And they have very little troops, or I should say their troops are very spread out. So in total, they've got three plus another four, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. So they basically have 22 figures of troops. And as you will see in other nations, that is just not a lot of troops. They are spread very thin. And they're going to have a very hard time trying to hold on to these territories or these possessions in the game. The problem is a lot of nations do not have the time or the resources to island hop. And that's what I love about this version of the game. Is because the U.S. could take all of these islands eventually, but there's just so many turns that drag on and on that you have to decide whether it is worth it or not. And Japan knows that. On the other hand, the more time you take to take these, the stronger Japan will be getting on Tokyo. And that will come into play when I show you Japan's objectives for this uh, game. Having said that, if we take a quick look at the map, we can see Russia has a vast area to defend, but by and large, they are going to be defending this kind of arc uh, where you can see Germany pushing through. There's this bulge starting to form in, in Russia where they are going to hope to invade it and split it in two. I'm not sure if I am going to follow the same techniques or strategies that the Germans did when they invaded Russia, or whether I am going to adapt. I will look at that with the Germans. The UK, 
Obviously, they are an island, and it is going to take a lot of time and effort to continually ferry or unload troops, and then you have to have somewhere to unload them. If Germany even moderately uh, fortifies these areas, it is not going to be easy to make naval landings. And of course, this is where they are going to need to do their D-Day in some way or another. There is Paris, or so Normandy is somewhere up in there. And we are going to see if D-Day occurs or not. Uh, the United States, obviously the East Coast is where you have Washington and probably the primary command of the U.S. forces. You also have the West Coast, uh, although it does take time to move forces from East to West on this map. So that is a problem with the United States is they are going to be fighting a war in two fronts against both the Japanese but then also helping the British against the Germans so very interesting we will take a look at the next setup I did Japan because it was the smallest one and the quickest one to do next I am going to do Russia and I will talk to you guys in that video about what uh, what we see with Russia's forces and when Russia comes into the board we will also discuss some more of the game elements, such as the battle board, such as your uh, your economic uh, industrial production points. And uh, then the next video, we will look at the next nation, which will either be probably the U.S. or Great Britain. And we will then get into some more details on the pieces in particular. So I hope you guys hang around for this series. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if you've done something like this and how it worked out for you. Take care. God bless. Mm -hmm.